Hello, Inside Great Minds listeners. This is your host, Adam Outland, and today's guest is very special indeed. Dan Moore has been a great mentor of mine throughout my career and business life. Dan Moore sold books with Southwestern Advantage while he was uh, graduating from Harvard University. Um, He holds an MBA with honors from Vanderbilt, Owens Graduate School of Management, where he was named class speaker. Fast forward, Dan was promoted to district sales manager with Southwestern Advantage, and in July of 2007 was named president. So from an 18-year-old summer intern to president, he never worked anywhere else. He served on the company's board of directors until his retirement in January. He presently serves on the board of the Direct Selling Association and the Direct Selling Education Foundation. He is also a co-founder of SBR Consulting in London and Southwestern Consulting in the States, a member of Southwestern's family of companies. And uh, he's actually, through his career, taught more than 100,000 people how to sell, how to lead, and how to get on a path towards achieving their goals in life. You're gonna learn a tremendous amount about uh, Dan's experience, which he's encapsulated in his book, Control, Influence, and Accept, which is going to be part of the premise of this interview today. So I hope you get to tune in and take as much away as I did from this conversation with Dan Moore. Let's welcome Dan Moore. What India had for you guys, that was, um, was it just purely uh, travel or was it... um, deeper than that? Actually, deeper than that. Um, Several years ago, probably six or seven years ago, Maria went through yoga teacher certification at a place in Pennsylvania called the Himalayan Institute. Went to visit her one weekend up there. And when I was walking the grounds, I thought, this is a beautiful, beautiful setting. Maybe when I eventually retired, it'd be fun to come up to a place like this for a month or so. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, they had a plan where if you volunteered your talents for a, a month, you could stay for free for a month and take classes and so forth. So I said, perfect. Then they changed the rules. You had to volunteer for a year. Wasn't quite ready to make that kind of a commitment up there, but the idea is still planted in my head that it would be really a nice thing to do to, to go someplace and really think about the next chapter of our life. In the meantime, one of the ladies in Maria's book group shared some of the experiences she'd had in India at some wellness retreats in Southwestern India. So we got interested in that, did some research, checked into it. I'd always wanted to go to Nepal, so we tacked that in. So the first two weeks was really touristy stuff which is beautiful, amazing country, incredible history, tremendous blending of cultures there, both in India and Nepal. But the last three and a half weeks was at an Ayurvedic wellness retreat in Kerala, which is a state in Southwestern India. We're about 80 miles or so from where the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean and the Arabian Sea all merge, the very tip of India. And the resort overlooked the Arabian Sea and each day was, was just a magnificent experience of being calm, centered, uh, yoga, did some reading, did some chilling, all vegetarian for three and a half weeks, no caffeine, no alcohol. It was just an amazing change experience. And the whole goal was to, to draw a really thick line between the previous world of work and, and the new world of retirement. And for me, I made to do some thinking and talking and planning without really having an objective to come up with a conclusion at the end of it. Just to have that time to realize and breathe, okay, things are different now. Fortunately, the company's done such a brilliant job with great leadership. Things are moving along in a fantastic way. So I have no regrets about that aspect. They're brilliant leaders, and they're going to make it happen every single time. So that's a little bit about it. Um, what we got out of it continues to rebound in our lives, just the sense of, of calmness, of awareness that it's a huge world out there and that our North American-centric focus is missing out on a whole lot of the world. So this is going to tee us up perfectly for um, talking about your book, which I had the opportunity to read before anyone else, because you sent me a copy. Um, So control, influence, accept for now, right? CIA, FN. And um, as you're talking about, when you talked to me a little bit about this retreat on a phone call that we had prior, uh, made me think about asking you this question when we talked about the retreat um, today. And that's because one of the things you talk about in your book is self-awareness. And you you have some tips and pointers that you have underneath that about how to become more self-aware. And one is to be an intentional observer of yourself. And I've heard this before, and I know it's such a good thing to do, you know, but there's this resistance in your head that's like, well, like, when do you sit down to just observe yourself, right? Like, when are you just sitting down going, huh, let me, let me watch myself 
uh, with intention. And I, I feel like this retreat was part of that for you, right? Was some intentional internal observation, but I'm, I'm curious, maybe you can speak to this as well. So at the retreat, but even prior as president of Southwestern Advantage, how did you practice self-observation when you're so busy and there's so much happening around you? Well, fortunately, our brains are pretty active creatures. Somebody once said, in fact, we can think about seven times faster than we can talk, which means the brain can be processing things at all kinds of different levels. So over time, I guess with Maria's guidance and through understanding yoga a little bit better, I've learned to kind of separate myself, part of my consciousness from what's going on in the rest of my consciousness, almost like an observer. Our yoga teacher calls it the silent observer. Mm. And the silent observer is almost like a narrator saying, well, look at Dan standing there talking to Adam right now. He seems like he's pretty calm, pretty chill. Nobody realizes how scared he is on the inside, but he's doing okay. So this, this silent observer is almost a, a, another party, but it's really not. Uh, it can be aware when we feel our temperature rising, we're getting a little bit upset about stuff. It can say something like, hey, you know what, Dan, no point in getting upset about this. Just breathe our way through it, calm down, keep things in proper perspective. So that's a little bit about how I think we can do that better is just realize we have that faculty if we choose to use it. Imagine this uh, little spy plane over there just hovering over your head, looking around and saying, hey, calm down, calm down, chill, chill. It's okay, it's gonna be all right. Yeah, so it, so for you in, in the heat of the moment of things, you, you've you kind of taken to a little bit of a yoga practice of just taking a deep breath and taking a step back of what's going on in the moment. And you've kind of built this in habitually for yourself to to go through this exercise or or, and, and I'm sorry if I miss it, is it like something you literally plan out like on a daily basis that at this time you're going to do some self-reflection or is it you, when you have an emotional reaction, you go, okay, I'm having an emotional reaction. Let me work through this process of self-observation here. Well, it's not quite as organized as all that where I have a specific time for self-observation, the rest of the times of other observation, et cetera. I've been thinking about this for a really long time, ever since I was 19 and I read Viktor Frankl's book for the first time, mm. that his own sense of, of his internal driver that kept him going, kept him alive, in fact, was constantly there, despite what was going on in those camps. So I realized many, many years ago that my own awareness of who I am at the moment, things I'm thinking about, things I'm doing, are going to have ripple effects on other people and on my own future. So they're going to have present effects and they're going to have effects in the future of my life and other people's lives. So let me always be intentional about what I'm doing. Mm. And that includes the way I'm thinking. Um, because when we think good thoughts, good things tend to happen. We think not so good thoughts, things not so good tend to happen. Seems like a simplistic way to put it, but it's literally the truth. And my mind, like anybody else's, can spiral into places we don't want it to spiral into. So having the ability to pull it back into the focus, pull it back into something more constructive and productive, is a big part of that self-awareness, I think. Yeah, I I thought about that part of your book. And, um, you know, three weeks ago, I was, you know, we, we'd have a three-week-old and 18-month-old uh, and um, learning a whole new routine and schedule to, to juggle two kids instead of one. And, um, you know, some late nights peppered into that. Um, and I was I was struggling with, you know, being tired and um, not feeling like I could process things. And um, what that part of your book called attention to for me was recently I started getting back on a schedule going to the gym and just mm -hmm. on the treadmill, which is kind of a rote mindless exercise, uh, gave my brain a little space to really reflect, you know, and that reflection um, and moving my body were both very healthy things that even though it seems like it would be more exhausting to go to the gym, than to just not uh, actually contributed um, to me feeling a lot better over the last week. And uh, there's a few things in your book, and I want you to speak to this, uh, that that wrapped around for me too, that I thought was really interesting and I'd never heard before. And one was the uh, the being bored concept. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit and where you got that idea from? Well, it was uh, I was having dinner with an alum out in Utah, Kirsten Park, years ago. Kirsten sold in the 80s for 10 summers. Terrific person from Alaska, involved in theater, all kinds of things over the course of her career. And we were always share ideas about books and so on. She said, I read this amazing book called Bored and Brilliant. And I said, what? Bored and Brilliant? She said, yeah, by Manoush. Um, boy, I had it before you asked me the question. I blocked it, blocked it out. 
she's got her own amazing podcast, incredible writer, incredible thinker. And the whole notion there is that when we don't have our brain always in a rigid path of what needs to happen next, it's going to come up with a lot of creative stuff. And as soon as I read the book, Marisa Zamarodi is her last name. As soon as I read the book, I thought about one of my friends from Los Alamos, where I grew up, whose father was one of the leading nuclear physicists there at the laboratory. And he loved to water his garden. And she'd water his garden for an hour or so, just wandering around, and then go in and sit down and create amazing equations and formulas of things that had occurred to him while he was watering the garden. And my friend said, that's my dad's creative time, watering that garden. Anything that we don't have to really concentrate on too much lets our brain rove where it's going to rove. One of the great techniques in Manusha's book that's really kind of fun is take a problem that you're wrestling with, for example, a specific problem, and write it down if you can in a word or a sentence or two. And then for the next seven minutes, watch a pot of water begin to boil. That's not easy to do that because it takes about seven minutes from a cold start to stand there and do nothing watching this pot of water boil. And eventually when it gets to a full boil, then look at your problem again. Odds are very good that there'll be some insight that hadn't occurred to you before because the subconscious mind is working on it while the conscious mind is being bored out of its tree. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's an interesting concept of Manuja Zamarodi, terrific author. It, the podcast is really fun to listen to also. It was such a cool insight and uh, I'm glad you attributed it back to a book that I can also read. But it, you know, because I think about ideas and how my brain processes when I'm driving or I'm in the shower and you know, I was trying to put a finger on um, maybe why that occurs. And I think um, that aspect of your book did a really uh, good job describing that. So um, what about, um, I guess, just kind of backing up for a second. I, I've got so many notes from reading your book and so many really good observations and you're a master storyteller. So it, it brings it to <laughs> life. just kind of here are the anecdotes. Um, why write it? What What was your what was your driving motivation to put all everything down on paper? Because I can attest to the fact that it's very difficult to put <laughs> 200 and some, you know, pages uh, together in a book. Well, it's only 34,000 words. War and Peace is something like 100,000, 300, 3 million, some large number like that. So yeah. Tolstoy definitely had it on me. I've always loved books, Adam. Uh, ever since I was a little guy, Mom had to pry me out of the library. I'd convince them to let me take more than my limit. Just always loved the written word. I was privileged over the years to have a dad that was a creative writer in addition to being a mathematical statistician. And my mom was, had a great sense of humor. She loved to write short stories. So storytelling was a big thing in our family. Humor was, was a big part of what we did around the table. Hmm. And as I'd read books and I'd see what people had to say in print, it moved me in different ways. And this, I understand, was way before we had online, way before anything like YouTube existed and Instagram, et cetera, the written word. When I was about seven or eight, I was looking at the back of a comic book because the only thing I liked to read was comic books. And there was a, an adventurer pictured with a, a young boy talking about Machu Picchu high in the Incas. And the little boy said, boy, I'd love to go there someday. He said, you can, I'll take you now. He took him down to the library and got a book about Machu Picchu. He said, you can read your way into any place in the universe if you really want to. So I felt like if, if I could do something like that in writing where people could be impacted by it, it could be just a terrific thing for, for them. And for me, it was a personal challenge. Can I take some of the stories, can I just take the things I've been teaching for a long time and put it in a way that'll have meaning and purpose for, for other people, mm -hmm. particularly people that don't come from the same cultural background, being in Southwestern Advantage and selling books. And that's been really a fun thing to see how, how people have responded to that too. You know, we, we can influence a certain number of people in our lives and those people influence other people. But some of the great authors, their books have been influencing people for a millennia. Hmm. I don't think this book is anywhere close to that level. But I do think that the written word can be enduring and can last and can get people stimulated and triggered to maybe do some good things. That's, that's the whole purpose. And then also just the whole challenge of trying to get it done. Yeah. That was a fun experience. If you don't mind, and I, I do want to tackle a lot of other thoughts in your book, but I mean, just what are the rationalizations and the, the walls that you had to fight through to get this done? Because it, it's a huge project. And for people that don't know, like putting a book together, um, you're, I feel, and maybe you had a different experience, but I feel like you're always fighting yourself a little bit and you're your own worst critic when you write something down and go back and read it. And I mean, what did this just, what's the creative process been like for you? 
Well, this the heart of the book really was a presentation I've been giving for many, many years on how to prepare for the future that nobody can really predict. Mm -hmm. And so over time, I'd refine the, the order of events of what I thought people needed to learn about. And then putting the book together was more taking that and putting it in print in a form that was helpful to somebody that didn't know anything about what we did for our business for a living. So the process itself was uh, stop and start. I remember getting all excited about writing the book in 2016. And I think I wrote for maybe an hour one afternoon. And then I kind of forgot about it. And a couple of years later, I went back to the book saying, I must be nearly finished. I'd only written about three pages. Two years later, I hadn't written anything new. So I said, this is terrible. 2019, I got really serious about it. Uh, Maria and I had scheduled our first ever three-week vacation trip to the Azores, the islands off the coast of Portugal that Maria grew up on. And while I was there, I wrote about 80% of it. And so we'd do some hiking in the morning. In the afternoon, she would go chase down genealogical references to her family and other people she loved to learn about. And I found a cafe someplace that just began to write, just let it pour it all out. And the process of writing, I think, is, is important that you just write stuff without rereading it. Don't go back and reread stuff. Just do kind of a brain dump, get it all out on paper. Because the, the writing process is part of it. the editing process is even more important. Uh, one of my favorite fiction writers, a guy named John Irving, who wrote, oh, so many amazing novels. Um, the World According to Garp was his first big hit. Mm. And John Irving said, I'm not a very good writer, but I'm an excellent rewriter. So his process was get it all down and then go back and rewrite it. I was blessed to have two terrific editors that helped me with this project, one in California, one actually in Germany. I regard them as almost philosopher's stones because their ability to take this lump of, of stone and turn it into something more glowing. So that editing process was also really, really important. The book currently is about half the length of the original book, maybe even less than half. Wow. Because that core dump got so much stuff out there, much of which was going down rabbit trails. It was disorganized. It was away from the central point. So the good thing about that is maybe there's core material for something else out there eventually, but the whole process was winnowing it down, trying to get to the, the core information that would be most helpful to people, mm -hmm. most inspiring to people, because that's the real goal, I think, of anything we try to do, try to move people so the world's a bit better. Love that. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing. I, I think uh, you're probably one of the benefits of writing this book in particular is that you got to write about your own best advice as you wrote it. <laughs> so you get to hear your own advice as you go through. Um, and some of the things that I, I thought were just really interesting aspects. One was the difference between brain set, mindset, and skill set mm -hmm. um, as a way to articulate. Um, I think that topic was, was it on um, um, getting out of kind of uncomfortable situations and how you handle um growth it, it, wasn't that the concept that you were um tackling with those three yeah and it was certainly not my concept um in my early days of being a podcast host one of my guests was a woman named ellen petrie leance a brilliant thinker she's most recently involved with stanford university but she went to work with apple computer in 1982 which tells that steve jobs and she were close proximate buddies there she was involved in many, many important companies over the years. She's just a really good thinker. And in our conversation, we got to be talking about skill set and all, you know, mindset, et cetera. And she said, well, let me tell you my three sets. And that's where the brain set, mindset, skill set came in. The way I picture it mentally, because it helps me if I can picture things, it's almost like a ratcheting up process. So our brain set is what keeps us alive. You know, if we hear a sound of a predator, we want to avoid it. We need food, water, et cetera. We're going to try to take care of those things. That's the brain set. The brain set naturally doesn't like change. Change often represents threat. Mindset is when we make a decision, we want to do something. This is using the forebrain, whereas the brain set is much more in the, the primitive, what's sometimes called the reptilian brain. Hmm. Well, the only way we can convince the reptilian brain that things have really changed is if we form a new habit. And that becomes the skill set. So if we focus on developing the skill set, then eventually kicking and screaming, that reptilian brain says, well, okay, I guess we can come along on this ride. And then my mindset is now advanced. So it's ratcheted upward. So goal setting by itself is never going to be enough. People can dream a goal for a long time. Unless they get into action, they're never going to convince that brain set that things are different. Things are a little bit changed here, which is why there's breakthrough moments. The, 
the first race when somebody achieves the time they want or the first workout when they really feel like they did something great or that moment when they they sang a song for the first time in front of people and and it went okay these are times to convince that the brain said no it's okay you can come out of your cave we're moving up but if to avoid those being one-offs we have to do them repeatedly until they become something more of a habit so ellen's insights were just tremendously helpful to me and glad that you picked up on that so i gave her plenty of space in the book yeah i well it made me think of uh just when i had a personal realization from uh coll- a colleague of mine that i i sold books alongside um uh, his his name's john Carey. if you remember that young man absolutely do <laughs> and john had this a tendency to just be hyper athletic and good at anything that he seemed to do and uh and not just athletics i mean he was great at selling uh books right southwestern and um, but what I paid attention to is trying to un- understand why uh, he ended up being good at things. And it's it's this curiosity that he had and this self-confidence of coming into something, knowing that he could grow a skill set from scratch, right? So mm-hmm. he, had, he almost had trained his brain, from my perspective, to approach something with curiosity, uh, knowing that if he you know engaged with it, he could just develop the skill to do it. And he could develop it really well, maybe better than most people uh, if he exercised it enough. And uh, that was an, an incredible lesson that I took with me from just observing him. And I think you articulated that really well in your book. Yeah, I do know John. He is he's a phenomenon. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and, and Dave Brown has some elements of that too, right? So it's that mm-hmm. curiosity that, dri- that drives. Um, and, and you talk a little bit around curiosity a lot in your book too. Um, when you talked about incorrect assumptions. And uh, I really like this part because I feel like it's a, a challenge for um, many, many people. And, and I, I don't disclude myself. You know, I think um, I've gotten a chance to exercise the muscle of, of checking assumptions uh, more mm-hmm. uh, every year that I get older. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, but you, you do it a good job talking about um, curiosity as opposed to assumption. And I wrote this down. Um, how does someone learn to be a good observer without making assumptions? Because sometimes it's really hard. And so I wanted to ask you that, like what, how does someone actually learn to be a good observer um, without making assumptions? I knew the answer to that one. It'd be a a really fun thing to talk about because nobody's perfect at that by any means. We all have filters, right? Some of them are things we're born with. Some of them are things that we get acculturated to. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, really does a great job talking about these biases that people have when they walk into a situation. And becoming aware of those is the first part of, of the ability to get past that into a better way. Um, I think the only way we can do that is to practice what Heinlein calls being a fair witness. Uh, have you read the book, Stranger in a Strange Land? I have not. Classic, classic. One of the great science fiction novels of all time about two earthlings that go to Mars and they end up having a Martian baby and the Martian baby comes back to earth. His name is Michael Valentine Smith. But along the way, he meets a guy named Jubal Harshaw and Jubal Harshaw says, I'd like you to meet my fair witness. What's a fair witness? A witness, what color is that house? There's a house on the hill. And the fair witness said that the side of the house facing us is white. Mm-hmm. She didn't make any judgment that the house is white. She said the side of the house facing us is white. Being a fair witness is really tough because we want to imagine the whole house instantly. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other side of it might be polka dots, might be pink, might not even be another side. It could just be a facade. So knowing that we all have biases, we need to look at things open-mindedly without jumping to some quick conclusion because the truth may be very, very different. And that's why I defined uh, flexibility as a mental and emotional thing. Mental and emotional flexibility. How quickly can we let go of a preconceived notion once we find the facts are different? And so many people cannot do that. Hmm. You and I are moving into the new election cycle for the 2024 presidential election. And the country is so polarized, both directions by people that just cannot see that maybe this side of the house is white, but let's don't make judgments about the rest of the house. Hmm. Not an easy thing to do, but it's such an important one. So if we can have that a mental and emotional flexibility and realize, well, things aren't quite the way I thought they'd be, how can we adjust to that? And that's the resilience piece that comes along with that. Mm. Yeah, politics is obviously one of the, the probably the easiest uh, 
category to, to talk about making assumptions because it's so emotionally charged right now. And uh, I, I interviewed uh, Aaron Schaefer, uh, I think, during COVID. He had published the book, The Politically Homeless Christian, <laughs> on, his, uh, on his feelings of assumptions that were being made around him. And uh, that was ended up being a really interesting conversation. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you this. I, I couldn't remember if you had done this or had not, but have you ever done Vipassana meditation before, Dan? The which meditation? Vipassana. Um, Kevin Johnson and a few folks did it back. I don't in the, think so. Huh. Um, that's the 10 day silent. Um, oh no, I've never done that. Okay. Um, if, if you ever get a chance, it's, it was really an extraordinary experience for me. It's non- it's secular as, as how they discuss it in nature, but it's really focused on breathing exercises. And you don't say a wait word for 10 days. And for me, um, what you wrote about, about assumptions, one of the most helpful things was learning just how to quiet my mind mm-hmm. long enough to not make judgment calls. Or if I did make a judgment call, because to your point in the book, you can't fully, and I thought this was really observant of you, you can't fully control your emotions. You can influence them. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that became so clear during that meditation because it was like a little wild monkey that you couldn't tame. And the cycle that you began to pay attention to from that meditation, Dan, was um you would you would suddenly wake up and realize you'd been thinking for like 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you're supposed to be focused on breathing and then you just shake yourself and go, oh my gosh, for the last 15 minutes I was chasing some thought in my brain. And, and then the next reaction to that was to shame yourself for making that mistake. And that makes it even worse. And it puts you down that spiral that you mentioned in the book. And over 10 days, the the general practice was instead of shaming yourself, just take, put attention around it. Don't judge or make an assumption, Um, step back and return to breathing if you like. Right. Um, Anyway, I, I just thought that was kind of an interesting experience where I got to live some of these principles that you talked about in this book. Um, but is well, that- and there's, there's centuries of information out there about the notion of a mantra, mm. which is a word or a phrase that's designed to trigger a certain response. Mantra is in every language the same, mantra. It's an old Sanskrit word. And ma- mantras are not just a sound. It can sometimes be a phrase. It can sometimes be something you visualize. But the idea of repeating it over and over and over can create a sense of, of stability and of comfort and of calmness. And my own personal mantra is the first line of the 23rd Psalm. My shepherd is the Lord. There's nothing I shall want. Mm-hmm. And I can say that 15 times in a row, not feel any better. 30th time, I start to feel better. 40th time, 50th time, 60th time. Mm-hmm. Then I start to say, okay, my shepherd is the Lord. There's nothing I shall need. It takes a little time to get there. And this is why most of us don't give enough time for this relaxation of time for this meditation of time for prayer and of time for thinking. Mm. And that's, uh, that's important, but every faith that known to the human history has had some ritual they go through and the rituals are all intended to give people a sense of the familiar and a sense of comfort. So that once they have that, they can go deeper in. Mm. If things are always changing all the time, think about what our brains have. If you walked into a church service or a community meeting of some kind, and the agenda was always different every time. The speakers were different. The chairs were different. The walls were different. Your brain said, be going, oh my gosh, what's going on here? I can't, and you not, wouldn't get much out of the whole thing. So that sense of the familiar can be beneficial to give our baseline of confidence. And then changes can be introduced after that at a little bit later time. Well, I like that practice. Um, so yeah, sometimes the first few times you affirm something to yourself, it, it doesn't necessarily take, you have to sit with it. You do have to sit with it. And, and what you affirm needs to be something that at least got a hint of the believable in it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that was another great point you made because uh, coaching clients, some of them had uh, some of the clients that I coach and and you've had this experience too, I think have a predisposition to self-talk. That's not positive, right? They learned it. And some self-help guru talked about just steamroll your emotions with self-talk, right? Or they come in with like maybe a little bit of the, um, uh, what was that SNL sketch that kind of teased around self-talk? Was Stuart, Stuart-, Stuart Smalley. I'm so good enough. Talk- I'm smart enough and doggone it, people like me. 
That's right. And I'll, I'll bring up self-talk to some people and they'll go, oh, that's the Stuart Smalley bit from SNL. And uh, and so they have this kind of like frou-frou mindset around it because when they tried it once, it just felt like they were lying to themselves. And, and you talk about um, the appropriate and less effective way to go about doing this. And um, what's been your approach to effective self-talk and how to get it to stick and make it effective? Well, that's that's a great question, Adam. To me, the most important word is constructive. Mm-hmm. Constructive self-talk. Now, for a long time, I would try to do positive self-talk. And there's really a very great deal of value in that. But if we're stuck, we're not moving at all, we sometimes need a real kick in the tail. And a kick in the tail is not always a positive thing. And here's a really simple example. The first time that I was out selling books, I was losing my incentive, losing my motivation. It was hot, San Antonio, Texas, middle of July, frustrated. And so I try to say positive things like, you can do it, Dan. You're a champion. You're a winner. And the more I did that, the less I felt like a champion, a winner that I could do it. So I took my little pad of paper and I wrote down, work, you slug. Now, I don't know if all our listeners have ever seen an actual slug, but for those that haven't, it's like a snail that can't afford a house. It's ugly. It's not fun. It's slimy. I didn't want to be a slug. And so I would work my way out of that mood by just saying, work, you slug. To me, that was extremely constructive self-talk because the things that are just positive all the time don't always move us. The world does not always have positive happenings in it. Having a realistic and constructive approach to those is vital. Hmm. You know, I uh, had a conversation with a family um, recently. Uh, one of our divisions of our company works with teenagers and provides coaching for um, for youth. And part of the motivation to do that was exactly what you talk about in your book, that one of the most profound things that I uncovered working with Southwestern Advantage and you was um, the power of what you say when you talk to yourself and how much that makes a difference. And um, this young person is in, in a very esteemed institution uh, that you would probably be familiar with. University of Maryland? <laughs> I, I, I wish it were uh, Maryland was as esteemed as this institution, but in graduate program, engineer, uh, brilliant, brilliant mind. And, uh, but when I talked to him, um, he just sounded so defeated, so much of a, um, he even said it, he said, I have imposter syndrome here. I don't, Mm -hmm. um, I don't talk to people because there's only 20 other people in my graduate program. And I don't think my words matter to them. Like, I don't want to waste their time because they have so much going on and they're so brilliant and just so little, um, self of affirmation or self-belief sure. and you can hear it in the language mm. that he says to himself. And some of the people that are least, who we'd least expect to feel that way actually feel that way. Mm. I can relate to that. The first week or two I was at Harvard, I was convinced I'd been a mistake in the admissions process. The admissions officers got up to take a cup of coffee and somebody came back with a dart and threw a dart, hit my application. They said, let's let this guy, in. it'd be kind of funny. Yeah. Said, Talk about feeling like I didn't belong there. And that was hugely important. But the bottom line is people don't make those mistakes. This young man you spoke to is in that graduate program because he deserves to be there. Hmm. Somebody with perspective said, this is somebody can add something. One of the lessons that I guess I learned most from the podcast I hosted for those several years that you now host, The Action Catalyst, is I'd frequently speak to my guests Mm -hmm. and I'd say, so what would you advise somebody when they're just at the end of the rope? They got no cards in their hand to play at all, no aces, nothing. And most of the time they came back to something very similar. And that was, first of all, realize you have done something in your life that's been good. Think about one thing you did that was good, one time in your life. Think about one or two people in the world that would look at you and say, she made a difference to me. She's a special person. And begin to let that seed of that one thing you did well, and those two people you had an impact on, realize I'm not useless. I had an impact. I did something well once. Mm -hmm. And I can really begin to grow. But if we don't allow that first spark to happen, there's never going to be any kind of a conflagration of, of goodness that happens after that. Absolutely. And I I thought about what you spoke about, about self-image in your book. And that's exactly, I think, some of the anecdotes that you talked about, about replaying things and um, that, that impact our self-image, right? That we, mm-hmm. uh, at times, our tendency is not to replay the positive things, 
over and over and over that impact your self-image, but true. the opposite. Um, and I, I loved how you spoke to this because it says what um, you you specifically said, was it the insult that someone said to you that really did the damage? Or was it the tape recorder replaying that insult 40 times um, that actually was the, the most impactful in a negative way? Um, so tremendously true. Yeah. When, when you were at Harvard, because um, you just brought that up, I mean, did you have, you, you said you had kind of these similar moments of wondering if you belonged, right? Mm. Uh, why, why was that? And if you don't mind, I mean, just maybe speak to that. And what was, what was the tape recorder that you had to turn off during those undergraduate years? Mm. It's the notion of making inappropriate comparisons between ourselves and other people. Mm. It's, it's kind of human nature. You know, they'd say, okay, arrange yourselves by order of height. Okay, I'm not tall. I'm not short, but I'm not tall. Let's arrange yourself by alphabetical order. Oh, my last name is in the middle. I'm just never going to be stand up just in the middle. For whatever reason, people make comparisons that are often unfair. They might look at an area that they're weak in, look at somebody else's strength, and almost always come up short. Almost always. And as a result, we can sometimes think, well, I don't even deserve to be here because I can't do X, Y, or Z. And when I got to Harvard the first week, uh, it was very disorienting because I met so many people that were better spoken, better dressed, better traveled, better educated. Obviously, they came from financially bigger circumstance than I came from. And I'm from New Mexico. In mm -hmm. fact, I met a guy who had grown up in New York City and in Beijing clearly a world traveler and interesting fellow. At the end of our conversation, he said, where did you say you're from? I said, I'm from New Mexico. He said, hmm, you seem awfully sophisticated to be from New Mexico. Now, I don't know if that was a compliment or a put down, but I took it as a put down. like, oh, shoot, I'm just a hick from New Mexico. Hmm. And because of that, I was not prepared for building up my own self, my own achievements, things that caused me to be there. I had every right to be there like everybody else did. But we tend to make these, these inappropriate comparisons. We look at somebody else's great strength, particularly it's an area where we can, we're going to come up really short. So knowing that we've got our own strengths and we can play off those, everybody's got something that they can add to the world in a good way. We've got to spend time amplifying and building those to ourselves and then to others. I read uh, the book Tribal Leadership, um, and it was a, a really big influence for me. And one of the little pieces of that book was the Stanford professor that was a contributing author um, had done uh, a research study with a large number of Fortune 500 executives um, where they surveyed them about their greatest fears. And this mm. is heavily paraphrased because I don't have it in front of me, but um, the, something when they got the answers, it was almost universal that in some version or variation of I'm afraid people will think I'm not as good as they think I am. <laughs> That's that imposter syndrome thing. It is. Yeah. Isn't that funny? But you would you think maybe that would just be assigned to certain folks, but even folks in in high levels of leadership still have moments of of that self-doubt, right? That they they get to and that self-image that you talk about in your book and how you um you wonder those things. So um yeah I I love how you approach it. Um but how what are some ways that you talk about in your book to um, improve perspective and change perspective? Well, I think the first thing is to zoom that lens way out. Mm. We tend to zoom in so tightly. I'm going to scare everybody to death right now. That when we're this tight in, we can't see anything. I can't even see you. You're just like a blur. If I back up, okay, begin to see things a little bit better. In fact, a fun illustration for people is to take their phone and take a picture and then take another picture with their finger over the lens and look at both pictures. The one with your finger over the lens, all you can see is your finger. Mm. You gotta move the finger in order to see what else is out there. So zooming back a little bit and thinking things like, okay, this feels like a disaster in the making here. Is it really? Is it really? Dale Carnegie wrote an amazing book that I read my second summer, 1975, called How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. Hmm. kind of like that because I was a big worry wart and he said there's three real keys to it first thing you do is say to yourself what is the worst thing that could happen here worst possible thing realistically 
because my brain would say the worst thing is that I'd be walking down the street and a giant T-Rex would come around the corner and eat me in one bite. That could be the worst thing. Well, probably not. What's the worst thing that happened realistically? And you got to come to grips with that. You got to absorb it, get into your head. This could happen. Second thing is to say, could you survive it? Would it end your life? Would it end your existence? Would, could you survive it? And you think about that long enough to realize, yeah, I, I could survive it. And then step three is do everything in your power to avoid that worst thing possible happening. It goes back to control the things you can control. That was a fundamental breakthrough for me. I think I was 75. I was almost 20 at that point when I read that. Extremely valuable, important stuff. But that helps us get that perspective also, especially when we're in an interpersonal challenge with somebody, could be at work or personally, we think it's never going to get better. This is awful, awful, awful. And at the moment, it is awful, awful, awful. So coming to grips with that at first is really important. But once we realize that we can get past that, then hope begins to emerge again. And hope is fundamental to almost everything. We've got a really dear friend right now who's just had heart surgery for the third time and reminds me of a man named Norman Cousins who wrote a book called Anatomy of an Illness. And in the book, he one of the conclusions that he came to is that medicine is not always essential, but wanting to get better is. And I think that helps our perspective in so many good ways. Say that again, medicine is not- essential. Medicine isn't always essential, but wanting to get better is. Mm. Medicine doesn't always work, but wanting to get better is essential to do well. That's so right. that's what the human instinct has is the ability to, to want to get better. Mm, that's good. I like that. Um, I feel like you had a big opportunity to exercise all of these muscles yourself um, that, you know, I say you're, you're preparing for moments when in uh, 2020 COVID happened and you found yourself as president of an organization responsible for showing up at people's doorsteps, presenting educational tools and materials in person. And uh, you were faced with, um, I would imagine, some moments where perspective would become really important. Um, can you talk about how you applied some of your own lessons in, in that moment uh, to overcome that, that challenge? Well, fortunately, Adam, it was certainly not all about me. We had an incredible team at Southwestern Advantage of leaders that always had this attitude, we can find a way somehow or another to make things happen, no matter what the situation is. But I had to go through this feeling of despair first, the sense that, okay, this is March, middle of March, the summer's supposed to start in six weeks time. We're door-to-door -door business. We've been going door-to-door -door for 150 years. If we can't go door-to-door, -door, what's gonna happen? Are we gonna lose the business? Is it gonna go under? Are we gonna not make it through this mess? And Maria and I were actually on a walk. We did several walks during those early weeks, especially. And I looked at her and I said, I, I, and she just said, look, Breathe, always good advice, breathe first, take mm -hmm. it by degrees, mm -hmm. and we're going to figure out something different. And it occurred to me, you know what? If we can't sell door to door, it doesn't mean the company's going to close. It doesn't mean the opportunity is going to change. And so we began to have meetings and conversations about that. I give a lot of credit to our head of sales, Mark Rao, because he pulled two of his top recruiters out of recruiting and said, Danny and Edgar, I want you guys to develop a way to sell products online and through Zoom. Neither one of them knew how to do it. Nobody knew how to do it. But they spent a week, each of them, about 80 hours a week just trying to figure out how to get that to work. Then each one got a small team. Those teams then practiced it. They had a little competition going on. And about middle of April, we realized we might not even be able to have a sales school. So we decided we would do virtual sales schools, teach people how to sell online virtually with the hopes that eventually we could go back to selling again. But the goal was to let people know this program is not going to die. It's not going to end. It's going to continue. It may look different, but it will continue. We'll still make a difference to families. We'll still make a difference to the young people in the program. And so it was a huge team effort. Great support from Henry Bedford, from the board of directors, from the leadership of our company through that whole process. At the same time, what was going on in Europe, there were travel bans in place. The president said nobody can come to this country. And then there were COVID bans that closed embassies. So more than half of our sales organization at that time came from Europe to the US. They weren't able to come at all. So we had to reopen the opportunity for them to sell in the UK, which we did in about two weeks. They also figured out how to sell things in their home countries, which to their credit, they did a magnificent job of that. And they continued again the next year. So for those year 2020 and 2021 were immensely challenging, scary, frustrating. 
but I give all the credit to the students and to the leadership of the company for having that ability to see it could happen and it would happen. We never gave up on the fact that our mission is always about making young people better people, developing skills and character to help them achieve their goals in life. It doesn't matter what the adversities are. Sometimes they can be threatening. I regard that as the biggest existential threat to our company. Could we get through this at all? And the answer is, yeah, we could, and we did. And it was certainly an amazing thing for me to cheer that great team of people to do that. Yeah, it's it's uh, well said. And I, I mean, I remember selling books um, in 2009, you know, and the fear coming into that summer is no one's going to have money. We're in a massive recession. Banks are going belly up and mm-hmm. you know, mortgage companies overextended. And, um, and that was my best summer. <laughs> amazing. Years, right. And, and, but it's a lot of those principles that you write about in your book. Um, in fact, uh, I'll show you this real quick. This became my, uh, my, my collateral for, um, myself and for clients. I don't know if you can see that, but oh, after, I love that this mountain, all your problems look like molehills. And I remember I feel like seeing that in an ad for like a Toyota Tacoma or something where they talked about mountains and molehills and, but it stuck with me. And I, and I feel like from perspective, you, you go through 2009 and you're like, well, how could it ever get worse than this? And then oh, it happens. And you're like, well, this might be worse. Um, <laughs> but, but every mountain you climb, you look back at 2009 and you go, well, that was silly. I mean, sure. There are people that were still able and wanting to invest in their kids' education. Why did we get so worked up about that? You know, it, it, so you get this perspective after the fact, but it's so much about, can you give yourself that perspective in the moment? Um, and I think you've you've done that time and time again, but it, it's a great message that your book delivers as well. Thank you, Adam. Well, the other side of that, of course, is the focus on our customers. These are all of a sudden you have the 98 percent of Americans that don't homeschool their kids are now having to homeschool their kids. They know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Even experienced teachers trying to teach through Zoom were frustrated with the inability to make that work in a good way. So one of the things that we developed was a t-shirt that said home educational resources, great big letters for the students to knock on the door. We made sure they're appropriately masked, that they ask questions. Is it okay for me to come in? Would you rather keep the distance, keep everything as safe as they could do? But the customer said, you're, I can't believe you're here. This is exactly what we need. Hmm. And our product was, was a product for the times. It was a perfect product but presented by amazingly sincere, diligent young people, made a huge, huge impact on families during that really tough time. For them trying to be good parents. Hmm. That's so cool. That's a great marketing switch to to um, to marry marketing with you know the care for the customer and being thoughtful of um, the challenges that they're facing at the time. Um, there's so much to talk about. Uh, again, I think that you know uh, whether it's optimism or um, I wrote down the difference. Maybe this would be a good one to end on. Actually, Dan, is the difference between joy and amusement when it comes to purpose. Can you speak to that? I can uh, do my very best. Uh, to me, the word amusement, it's really revealed this root word. The word muse is from an ancient Greek word that means thought. When we add A in front of it, it means without. So amuse is what we do without thought. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and being amused is fun. It's terrifically yeah. fun to be amused. Uh, a great movie, a great music, an evening with friends, hanging out, playing games, uh, playing sports, something. Amusement is just, we all need that. It's so important to have a sense of of that kind of fun in our lives. To me, joy is very different. Joy isn't always amusing. Mm -hmm. Joy can sometimes be accompanied by tears, the heartbreaking moments of our lives when when something is, is not happening the way it's meant to happen. We know we gave it our best. We did everything we possibly could. That can actually create a sense of, whoa, yeah. The kind of joy they spoke about in the Bible when they said, count it all joy when you're subject to diverse trials and diverse temptations and troubles. Count it all joy. I love the choice of that word. Mm. In some ways, joy and fulfillment are very similar. It's when our resources are coming together in such an important way to have a big impact both on ourselves and on the world around us. That's why somebody can be exhausted at the end of a sporting event and feel a great sense of joy. It's not amusing necessarily. You know, when you, when you finish a a long running race, for example, 
it's not amusing to realize every muscle you have wants to quit forever. But it's joyful. It's like, whoa, this happened. This happened. And that's the kind of joy that, that we speak of. So again, everybody needs amusement. I love amusement as much as anybody does. And great jokes are hilarious. They're fun. But that joy is a deeper sense of, of achievement, of accomplishment, of fulfillment. I was sitting on the, the couch last night and Tina got back from running a, t- a field hockey practice, my wife, you know, at 9.30 at night. And, uh, you know, we sit there kind of like, well, we're done for the day, right? I I had been sitting and um, listening to some nice music, um, completing your book, which did not make me feel blah, it made me feel very excited. But what, <laughs> but what I bring bring this up about is last night, and we were looking at each other and, you know, parenting a couple of kids and working really hard and we're exhausted. Mm. Very joyful in that moment. Yeah, that's a great way to, to view it, Adam. Exhausted, but feeling joyful. Yeah, and appreciative and grateful. And I'm grateful uh, you you were able to put all these ideas together and synthesize them. And, and honestly, very easy to read book and um, with, with great anecdotes, good stories. Um, I'm excited about your new endeavor with SBR. So that's exciting. Um, uh, SBR is our counterpart in the UK that um, are, are uh, one of our sister companies that does uh, training and consulting. Um, on a lot of these principles that you write about in your book. So I'm assuming that's going to be the, the next piece of, of life for you. Is, well, I've been involved with SBR since they started in 2002. So I uh, admire that group of people immensely, everything they've accomplished and achieved helping companies around the world develop these principles in good ways, which is terrifically fun. Yeah, so we can do more of that. They're going to have an audio version of the book. I'll be recording that in about three weeks. And that'll be kind of fun because sometimes people read the book and say, hey, it reads like you talk. Well, there's a reason for that. And so I'll be talking the book soon as well. So if for our listeners, if you uh, gain joy out of listening, Dan's uh, mel- melodic, melodic voice, uh, <laughs> you'll like the audio book as well. Um, and anytime you get to, to hear Dan speak, I mean, you're, you're just great at delivering stories. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that version of the book as well. Um, uh, you've, you've got that that fatherly tone um, in a good way and uh, in just your way of delivering on those stories is wonderful. So that'll, that'll turn out really good. I'm excited. Thank you, my son. <laughs> <laughs> that felt good. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for the time, Dan. <laughs>